with me? In 1926, when this recording of Hulse Planet Suite was made, there were thought to be only eight planets in the solar system. And then in 1929, a young man arrives at an observatory in Arizona to start the search for a ninth. At that time, very little was known about the planets. So closest to the sun you have Mercury, a tiny world of iron and rock, barely discernible in the sun's glare. Then Venus, possibly a second Earth, hidden beneath a thick blanket of cloud. Then Earth. And beyond us, Mars, the red planet. There are seasons, polar caps, and the possibility of life. Beyond the rocky worlds, you have the gas giants, Jupiter, over a thousand times the size of the Earth and Saturn with its distinctive and dramatic ring system. The two remaining planets are about 15 times the size of the Earth, but they're so far away that they appear as the most distant of stars. So you've got Uranus, which is, a, which is mysteriously spinning on its back rather than the other planets. And finally, Neptune, a world that moved unevenly across the sky. Now this irregular movement suggested the presence of a more distant planet whose gravitational pull might be toying with Neptune's orbit, Planet X. Back at the observatory seven months later, on the 18th of February 1930, this man, Clyde Tombo, sits here at a blink comparator. And he means searching on the plates that were centred on the star in the constellation of Gemini, the twins. He'd started that morning and he'd moved very, very slowly across, looking at images back and forth clicking and seeing one image and then another. And all these images were negative. Stars and anything else would appear white and any uh, stars, no, space would appear white and any stars on it would appear black on the white background. And about four o'clock that afternoon, he crossed the very center of the, of the reading that he was looking at. Crossed the guide star, Delta Geminor, a very big, bright star. And he moved a little bit more and a little bit more and then saw a very faint dot. And he blinked to the other reading on the blink comparator, and he saw it appear from there to there. On these plates, taken several days apart, Tombo had noticed that the point of light had moved, and he knew instantly that this is what he was looking for. It was a historic moment. He took a walk from the comparator room all the way down to the director's office. And he stopped at the door and he did his tie, combed his hair a bit, and he thought, I want to appear a bit nonchalant about this. And so he's knocked on the director's door, opened the door, cleared his throat. <clears throat> Professor Slifer, I have found your Planet X. Planet X was soon named Pluto. It marks the end of our solar system. But the technique that which took Tombo over seven months to study the images on that blink comparator to, find, to detect this planet has now not only been learnt, but automated. Today I'll show you a, uh, that same system which can detect cancerous cells in breast scan readings, drive cars and notify of oncoming traffic hazards, and yes, discover new planets where our best telescopes can't reach. So hi, I'm Nick. Uh, I'm a software developer at Keandra IT, and uh, I'm a self-confessed astronomy nerd as well. And uh, this is my talk about neural networks in deep learning, so let's get started. So the goals of this presentation are essentially to arrest some of the intellectual stigma that lies with a lot of machine learning and neural networks. And this is, comes from my own personal experience. And I found that whenever I've looked at a tutorial for neural networks, machine learning, it always suffers from one or two problems. And the recurring ones are it's always too mathsy or it gets too complex too soon. And so the goals of this talk is to give everybody sort of a medium to high level views of how neural networks work and then uh, so you can understand what's going on under the hood and then you can come away from this knowing which libraries to look at and uh, how to implement one yourself if you choose to. So this is what we're going to cover today. So goals I've already covered. So we'll talk about neurons, networks of neurons, and merge into deep learning. And I'll have examples uh, throughout the presentation. So let's start with a question. Why is everyone here? 
It's not a rhetorical question. I'm going to need audience participation here. Free beer. Free beer. <laughs> Sounds good. Anything else? Curious. Yeah? You curious? Okay. So you're here to sort of socialise with your peers a bit. You're here for you're here for Jim's Docker talk, for instance, later on. Not only for the free beer, you might be here for the pizza as well. Uh, you might have just had some free time, just thought, oh, yeah, I had a spare few hours, so I just thought I might learn about Docker and deep learning. Yeah. Astrology. And astro astronomy. Yes, absolutely. So how did you, given that you have all these possible reasons for coming, how did you go from that to actually deciding whether or not to show up? Did you weigh all these options up and decide, okay, so this is so, and so uh, you know, say the topic is this important, the free beer is possibly this important, and uh, the fact that I'm an alt.net regular, maybe that's sort of at a medium level. Um, and then you weighed them up and sort of thought, okay, so that's maybe, that's at that sort of sum, so oh, what the hell, maybe I should go. Well... Is this the sort of model that everybody's probably would have been thinking? I'd wager that at least some of us would have been thinking this. <laughs> so, essentially, yes, we have our reasons for coming, uh, our weighting of importance that we put to everything, and then we finally decide whether or not it's uh, above a certain level of importance and uh, decide whether or not to attend based on that. So... Developers being developers, we can kind of refactor this process a little bit and chuck this function and chuck this comparison here to its own little function. We'll call that activate. And then finally, we'll rename our reasons to inputs, give it a more general name, and then encapsulate everything into a node-like structure. And guess what? You've just learned how a neuron works. So us humans, we've got about 100 billion neurons in our brain and uh, they work by carrying messages or activating and sending messages to other neurons. And if enough neurons activate, our bodies can perform certain actions, walk, breathe, talk, whatever. And when you think of it, something as intricate as, say, picking up a pencil, throwing a ball or whatever, um, requires a tremendous amount of communication between all, these, all this neural activity going on in the brain. And uh, it's something that... I grow a greater and greater appreciation for whenever I'm playing tennis and my doubles partner sees me constantly hitting things into the net. That's, it seems a lot harder than what it is to actually correct everything because I've got to train a whole bunch of new neurons to actually work properly. So this is our architecture for a neuron. So just essentially a weighted sum. We check if it's greater, uh, greater than a certain value and then decide... And then if it is, we send a certain output value. And if it isn't, we send, a, we send a different one. And the reason that I called that one activate is that all neurons will have something called an activation function. And the one that we're using here today is the binary step, which is probably the easiest possible one. And deciding which activation function to use is dictated by what sort of output you're expecting from your neuron. So in this case, we're just expecting a number 0 or 1 but you may want a floating point value between 0 and 1, or a floating point between negative 1 and positive 1, or a category, or something between 0 and 100. So that's where your activation function is going to come into play. It has other applications, but for the purpose of this talk, that's all we need to consider. So, how do neurons actually learn stuff? Well, if you go back to our model, anything here that's a number is something that dictates is something that's going to dictate what our activity of our neurons going to be. So if we adjust the weights or the threshold here up at the top, that's what is going to change our behavior. However, looking and seeing that the threshold is up there at the top, it would actually be a bit easier if it was grouped with the inputs and the weights. It may not seem that intuitively at this stage, but it'll make sense as we go. So simplifying it. This is probably as matsy as this talk is going to get, hopefully. Um, so essentially what we do is that with our current activation criteria, we're just going to take uh, the threshold away from both sides, which is going to leave everything in this state here. And then finally, we're going to do this little rewrite here. And the beauty of doing this is that it's going to allow us to use our threshold as another input. Now, 
I'm just going to stop right now. Does anybody, have I lost anybody at this stage? No? Cool. So, this is now our model. And now all we need to do to get our neuron to learn is to learn everything in the weights column here. So this is what our updated architecture looks like. So let's pick it with some actual, let's, let's use some actual values for this. And so we uh, give our input some values and so say, all right, well, I'm interested with this speaker. I don't know who the heck this Nick guy, but he bears a striking resemblance to Rob Sitch, so we'll just go with him. <laughs> I'm so glad somebody got that joke. That's great. <laughs> Uh, topic, yeah, neural network sounds pretty interesting, free for um, so-so about that. So based on all that, you do the weighted sum, okay, 0.35, that's greater than zero. So in that case, we return true, so we attend. However, there is one possible problem here. What if our output is wrong? And by that I mean, what if our output of our neuron is not the one that we want it to have? So let's say that our target output, which is what we wanted to have, is say we don't attend based on those inputs. But it's actually outputting that we do attend. So we're going to have to find a way of adjusting the weights somehow. And we're going to need to take two steps for this. The first step is to use what's called a loss function. And that's a way of measuring how, me measuring the, uh, how inaccurate our neuron currently is based on what we want it to be. So First off, you need to work out the uh, prediction error, which is this error output here. And then after that, you, can, you need to work out how much each weight feeding into the neuron is contributing to that overall error. And uh, the loss functions that you can use, there are many different variants. I'll just use the absolute easiest one just for the purpose of this talk, which is just target minus prediction. And then finally, uh, once you've got the errors, how far each, how much each weight is contributing to the overall error of the neuron, you need a way of updating them. Now, the intuitive thing is to think, oh, okay, well, if my weight is contributing to, let's say, 0.5 of the error, it kind of stands to reason, well, I just add 0.5 to it and everything's going to be right as rain. But that only works well if you have one input and output set. You need some way of, because you might run into the problem where correcting it for one input-output set may make other input-output sets even more incorrect or make ones that were correct incorrect. And so you need a nice little way of adjusting how much you're modifying everything by. And that's what the learning rate is. And the learning rate uh, can be a hard thing to sort of set properly. Um, I typically pick something that's between 0.1 to 0.4. And the reason it can be such a hard thing to set is that if you pick something that's too small, it can take, it will find your optimum value, uh, optimum minimum error across all your, uh, all your input output sets, but it'll take ages to get there. But the flip side of that is that if you pick a large one, it's going to probably converge pretty quickly, but you may actually overshoot what your optimum minimum error is. So. Given that we've found the error and that we've updated the weights, we update the weights here, as shown in yellow, and then we find that our output is giving us the value that we want. And that is learning. So just to sort of summarise what we've looked at, um, so the learning process is we get the actual predicted output based on a set of inputs, so that's known as the forward pass, then we calculate our errors, so work out how wrong we are, and then update the network weights based on errors in the learning rate. And then we keep repeating on this until we're either right for all training cases, so input output sets, or we've just run this cycle a certain amount of times because we may not arrive at a case where everything is uh, getting the expected output that we want. So let's start using it at a few more meteor examples. So this is where you've got four sets of inputs and outputs, a binary or, and you would go through the exact same process with that architecture and what you'll find is that, uh, with, is that this architecture will actually learn this weight quite quickly. And uh, if, just going through the examples here, so with the weights here, so you've got 0.4, so if the other two inputs are zero, so that's going to output negative 0.4, which is what you want, output zero. 
and then because that 0.5 times 0.1 is going to be always greater than the 0.4, it's always going to uh, it's always going to cancel out the rest. And so in all the other cases, that's going to be one. Does that make sense to everybody? Cool. But if we pick a slightly more tricky case, which is the binary exclusive or, which is where we output one if either inputs are different, this won't converge. And there's there's sort of a reason for this, but at this stage, neural networks, we were probably at about 1969, 1970, and then two guys by the name of Min by the name of Minsky and Papert discovered this problem, known as the linear separability problem, and this actually halted neural networks being used for about 15, 16 years. And to sort of get an understanding of why that's the case, this is the decision boundary problem. So on the left you have binary or. And given that we've got one output neuron and two input dimensions, what we're actually doing is drawing a straight line between our two classes of outputs. So one class is just ones and one class is zeros. And as you can see, it's pretty easy to sort of uh, draw a straight line between the two. In fact, even though we're only se uh, sending in um, inputs of zeros and ones, we could theoretically put in there, say, 0 0.8 and 0 0.8, and it's still going to output a 0.1. However, with the binary exclusive or, as you can see here, there's no possible way to draw a straight line, one straight line that's going to separate all the classes nicely. However, there were many solutions proposed for this problem, but they didn't prove to be universal. But the one that did win out was in 1986. And that was to essentially add another layer of neurons between your inputs and your outputs. So how this works is that you use your inputs to work out some activation values for your, uh, for your middle layer here, and then those middle layers will then feed into some other weights and denote what's going to uh, be the output value. Uh, this is known as a hidden layer because typically when you're using this, uh, the user's not going to really see what's going on. They're only ever going to see what goes into the output and comes out of the output. So here's a solution for the XOR problem with uh, one hidden layer. And this is just an illustration of a learning process that happens when you have uh, a network of this type known as a multi-layer neural network. And even though I've only got one hidden layer here, you can have two, three, four, you can have tens of thousands of hidden layers if you really want to. So how it works here is that you use a combination of uh, the inputs and the weights leading out from the inputs to feed into your hidden layer. And from that you work out the activation values there. I should add at this stage is that there's nothing actually stopping you from using different activation functions in your hidden layers as to what you've used from your output layers. And even if you had two input layers, you could have a, you know, uh, the first layer outputting only values between 0 and 10, and then the second layer is outputting values between 1 and 100 for all you care. Um, as long you don't really care provided it's giving you the output values that you want. And so once you've got the activations for your hidden layer, you then use that and the combination of the weights leading out from that into the output, and then that determines the activation of the output. So once you've got that, given that our actual output is 1 but our target output is 0, we need to work out what the error is. And so error in this case is 1. So what we need to do now is go back and work out how much each of the weights leading into the output are contributing to the overall error, and go one step further, work it out for these, for these weights here as well. And once we have that, we can actually now update based on our learning rate and the errors that we've calculated, all the weights in the network. And then we do that, and then we rerun everything again. And that's how the learning cycle works. So here's sort of a summary of what we're looking at. So we've got determine the network's actual output by activating stuff from the input to, the, to each hidden layer up until the output. And then we get the error at the output and then do a process that's known as back propagation of errors, back each weight, uh, each hidden layer and weight leading into it through the network again. And then we update the weights again. And then we just re repeat that until uh, we either get all our test cases right or we've just run the cycle a certain amount of times. So before I get into this, any questions? No? All good. All right. So neural network architectures. 
So the type of neural network that we've looked at so far has been a feed-forward neural network, and it's probably the most basic of neural network uh, architectures. You also have uh, recurrent neural, neural networks, so everything else has just been having arrows moving forward, whereas recurrents uh, have the option of having stuff go back to previous layers. And a good way to think about this is that normal feed-forward neural networks are uh, sort of encapsulating almost conditional logic in their, in their thinking of moving stuff from the inputs to the outputs. But once you start adding connections back, um, you can actually have delayed activations of certain neurons. So you've almost got the idea of loops in your, integrated into your neural network. And then you can have some slightly more complex architectures like convolutional neural networks. Uh, and uh, they sort of restrict, overlay, and pull connections together. And uh, I haven't used them that much themselves, but uh, they're used quite heavily in image processing and uh, feature detection in images. And then the other type is the autoencoder. Um, so this is where you're actually trying to recreate your input in your output. And a good way of thinking about this is that it's almost, this is actually... Uh, abstracting or compressing what it knows about the input and, trying, and by trying to reproduce the output based on that, it's actually learning important features from the input. Which brings me into feature detection. So this is the result of Google pointing a neural network at uh, millions of YouTube videos. And this is the average inputs that caused a certain set of neurons in that network to fire. And what they found is that it actually resembled a, a human face. And Techniques like that have been used throughout to identify human faces and cat faces because there's no limit to cat videos on YouTube. <laughs> and, uh, and a nice little illustration of this technique is that uh, when you feed some uh, input into the, uh, into the in, like input images into the neural network, so you just say you've got a bunch of pixels as your input image. So what it's actually working out at each layer is it's working out um, interesting features that it's find that keep reoccurring. So at the first level you may find edges and then at the next level you may find parts of objects. So a couple of edges put together might represent an eyebrow or a nose or an ear. And then from that you can build object models on that. And then the more layers and nodes that you uh, neurons that you have within those layers, you can actually be more sophisticated in what sort of detail that you're able to find. Uh, I'm simplifying things quite a bit here, but uh, that's essentially what's going on. And as you get more sophisticated, you can go from something that's detecting a human face to detecting a certain human's face. So something like this can actually be sophisticated in saying whether or not this image is showing Nicolas Cage or it's not showing the greatest actor of our generation. <laughs> <laughs> so the same technique you can apply to character recognition. Um, and this was, uh, there's sort of a landmark paper on this in the late 90s by Young LeCun. And what he did was take... Um, a set of images where 28 by 28 pixels and you, uh, and so you've got 20 by 28 input nodes there and then you have seven layers of totaling about a thousand nodes and from that it's, uh, it then feeds into uh, an output layer and it just picks whichever one of these values is the highest and that's the one that it chooses. And these are some of the features that it's sort of, that it found at some of the networks and I found a very simple example. Waiting, waiting, waiting. No. That's it. Okay. So this is a, an example using D3.js, the data visualization library, and it's trained a simple neural network that rather than it's got sample images of shades from 0 to 255, it's actually just black or white, so 0 or 1. But what you find is that as you start colouring in circles, it has a, starts guessing what you're probably showing here. And as you change things, it changes its interpretation of it. So I'll try it again. So pretty interesting stuff. So another benefit of this is portability. Um, once you've actually trained a neural network, you can actually define everything in a flat text file because uh, if you have just one line defining 
what, the, uh, what each of the layers are and how many neurons there are in each layer and then for, have a bunch of lines after that describing the actual values for all your weights well you've just made your neural network portable so what this gives, <coughs> this gives you the ability to use for instance neural networks that have been trained somewhere else to start using as inputs into, into uh, other applications that you may be considering and so for anybody out there that's been is sort of aware of Google's Deep Dreaming, which I've sort of, I will cover later on. Uh, that's what you're able to do. So now onto deep learning. So we've kind of seen deep learning already in this talk, and deep learning was uh, the, the big tipping point with deep learning was that it allows for uh, multi, very large amounts of uh, hidden layers and neurons within those layers to be used. And uh, a lot of that's come with the increased computational power that we've, uh, that we've achieved in the last sort of 10 or so years. Um, there was sort of a core set of techniques as well, as well that we used to sort of take advantage of that as well. And that was done by three separate research teams, um, two of which, the heads of two of which are now uh, the head of AI research at Facebook and Google respectively. And... Uh, Yeah, this is just a bit of a timeline where things have been going. So, because you're allowing for many layers and many dimensions, you're, you're able to use it as a, in a wider range of applications. Because what you tended to find is that neural networks up until about 03, 04, um, they were very good for things like image processing, but anything outside of that, like, say, uh, natural language process, uh, processing, sentiment analysis, game, game playing or anything like that, uh, they weren't very good at being uh, tuned for working with. Um, and, yeah, cool. Uh, so, short term, it's been used for feature engineering, combining models, so using neural networks with other AI techniques and neural networks with other sorts of neural networks. So it's not uncommon, for instance, if you come across any sort of image processing that's been learnt by a neural network, it will actually have been learnt by two separate facets of that problem would have, would have been learnt by two different neural networks, like say a convolutional and a recurrent, and then th those two models will be combined together to get an overall output. Um, but it's been used in natural language process, image analysis, and uh, one of the cool things that it's starting to do now is actually learn how to produce new networks from old, from previously trained networks, and it's been used uh, to find patterns in unlabeled data as well, and for habitable planet detection. So we'll go through another demo here. So this is sort of a very simple demo. Cool. So this requires a bit more audience participation. So we're trying to pick which text is more visible on this background. So what's everyone think, the black or the white? White. Black, yep. White. White. White again. Yeah. Okay, so from now, so now this neural network built in JavaScript uh, now has enough training cases for it to be able to learn what we think that we would put it for new cases. So let's train it now. And here it is matched with the current uh, formula that's used to determine what colour text to put on there. And so we'll just go through a few examples. It may not be right for all of them, or it may. <laughs> yeah, we've done well. So all but one so far, one, 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 two. But you've got to think that's only from sort of five or six t training cases that we've been able to train that network. So here's something else that deep learning is being used in at the moment. Um, when you currently go to get a, a, any sort of cancer scan, or a breast cancer scan in this case, so typically what happens is that you'll have four different pathologists that will go and have a look at it, um, and they will try to identify areas of mitosis, which is the worst part of cancer. And they'll usually just draw a little circle around it or highlight it in yellow, as we're seeing here. And that's diagnosed as a cancerous area if, if it's in agreement with three of those pathologists. Now, about 
three years ago, we were at the stage where you could train a neural network that was in agreement with the majority of those pathologists in 70% of cases. Um, we're now at the stage now where a uh, deep learning neural network can be more in agreement with the group than any one single pathologist. And uh, so this, this is only going to get more and more refined and uh, used throughout the medical industry. Um, <coughs> deep learning is also being used by the entrepreneur Greg, Craig Venter um, in the, what's called the Human Longevity Project. And from that, he's looking for the molecular causes of diseases such as um, tumour identification um, and, uh, and heart disease. Deep dreaming. Has anyone here tried out deep dreaming at all? Yeah. It's both amazing and creepy at the same time. So <laughs> deep dreaming uh, uses an autoencoder, which I showed before. And it uses, and, and this autoencoder was trained on a certain set of inputs. And usually they were trained, I think the ones, the models that are out there, they were trained on pictures of dogs or snails. Those were most of them. And so what you find is that when you run new inputs through there, it, in what's called daydream mode, it tries to detect areas where it sees parts of that input image. And so you might have this behaviour, for instance, where it'll look at an edge and it'll think that that's a dog's nose. Or you might have um, a crescent and that might think it's a dog's leg or something like that. But you can actually tune it so it can um, try to identify interesting features the auto encoder has detected at different hidden layers. So at the very basic level, you have things like you have uh, very basic edge detection, and then you have more strict edge detection, like that. Quite arty, actually. And then finally, now look away if you want to go to sleep tonight. <laughs> so, uh, and not to pick on Steve Barmer too much, here's another one that I found. <laughs> now, another cool thing that I came across a little while ago was Mar.io. Has anybody seen this? So, yeah, Mar.io is was built by a guy who used to uh, hold the world record for completing Super Mario World, and uh, he's built. Um, well, he's built two, two neural networks. Now, the first one was used to actually learn an abstraction of the, uh, the level itself. And so that's what you see in the box there in the top left there. And then after that, um, it's using a, a neural network to work out which action, to, which action to, uh, to run next based on the state of the world and everything. And so your inputs are the state of the world and your outputs are a button on a SNES controller. And... It's also it's actually using a combination of uh, neural networks and genetic algorithms to sort of increase the search space and sort of randomise the different solutions that are available. And what it found is that after about 34 generations of of uh, running the genetic algorithm and the neural network, and so imagine you have about 100 solutions per generation, and then you pick each time the the, ver the best sort of five or six, and then you use that to populate your next generation. You breed them together and see if you have better solutions based on that. So after running that cycle 34 times, it was able to found, find uh, a Mario bot that could uh, successfully complete the level. And that's about a weekend's of work, worth of work. Um, the code to do this is available online. It's in Lua, and it's about 120 lines. So if you're ever looking for trying it out. He's also used it, um, there's a video also on YouTube of teaching the exact same architecture to play Super Mario Kart as well. Did it win? It didn't win. I think it got a place. Yeah, it got a place, but it hasn't won. But that was only after... He did a stream of it over a weekend, and uh, so there's a highlights video on YouTube. But, yeah, it's about 48 hours of training and everything, so it was a little bit trickier because you've got to think these things were very stupid at the start. So back at Mar.io, I mean, at the start... It was just sitting there and not even moving right. So it had to learn the behaviour that, well, first, for me to not die, I have to start moving right towards the end of the level. You know, so it starts very, very dumb. And then, you know, then it might walk along, get a mushroom, and then it'll start hitting enemies. So it now needs to learn to sort of start avoiding enemies or anything like that. It wasn't a sophisticated um, 
to the point where it learned to stomp on enemies. It learned more to just sort of a path that a path of least resistance that sort of avoided it. But uh, yeah. Who knows what the long-term impacts of deep learning are going to be? <laughs> yeah. I'm, not, I'm not insinuating anything, but yeah. So at this stage, depending on how we are for time, we can go through some further examples. How are we for time at the moment? Still got 15 minutes. We can go through everything. Right. Okay. Um, so we'll just go from the start. Self-driving cars. So we all know about Google's self-driving cars. But NVIDIA actually uh, wrote the system which is used to sort of identify objects that are on the road. And so how this was done is that uh, you had about 48 hours of footage of a car driving along the road. And then that was uh, fed into Amazon Mechanical Turk, which had just people on there identifying, okay, so uh, not whereabouts on the image, but just saying, okay, there's a truck on that image. And in this part, you know, uh, there's a pedestrian about to cross the road, or there's a red light here. And after that, it was able to train a neural network to actually learn how to drive the car successfully, uh, went around a, an obstacle course, and uh, yeah, without hitting anything, which is pretty amazing considering there's no, there's very little hand holding that's going on there. It's saying there's something interesting on the screen, here's what it is, I won't tell you where it is, and yet it was able to work out where it was and what to do about it. So this thing is so, so sophisticated that it can actually work out if a police car is following behind it as well. How much training is there? About 40 to 48 hours. Yeah. Yeah, so with, it was used with Amazon Mechanical Turk. Yeah, so they just uh, uploaded all the footage and they had people on there go on and just sort of mark whether or not something a particular thing was on the road. So what's interesting on here? Yeah. So sentiment analysis, this, this is being used at Stanford at the moment. Um, so Stanford researchers developed a tree bank of movie reviews and film, uh, yeah, movie reviews, concert reviews, etc., cetera, and uh, containing about 12,000 sentences. And each sentence, sentence contains a sentiment value. I'm not saying that three times quickly. And uh, so the sentiment of a sentence can either be very positive, somewhat positive, neutral, somewhat negative, or very negative. And, uh, and from that, uh, that, that data was fed into a deep learning neural network and achieved an accuracy of 80 to 85% on separate test data, 9.5% better than the previous. So it's so sophisticated that when you look at a sentence like this, I mean, overall looking at it, you see that it's actually quite negative. But there's bits here where it's got positive bits of sentiment and it knows whereabouts that actually turns from positive to negative. And so I guess the Turing test for something like this would be a sarcasm detector. <laughs> so that's my guess anyway. So image labeling. Um, so Google and, Stan and Stanford have developed this technique to uh, sort of a hybrid approach where they've used a convolutional neural network to read images and classify them. So say that this particular image is different from that other image but knows no other details about it. And then they've used a recurrent neural network to actually learn what's on each, each of those images in that group. And from that, it's been able to work out a way of describing it. So it's saying, boys doing a backflip on the wakeboard, or two young girls are playing with a Legos toy. So it's actually been quite sophisticated. And Google's now started to use this in cataloging all their image searches. So it's pretty interesting. Anyone here used word to vec at all? So word to vec was developed by Google a few years ago, and uh, based on a massive set of uh, a massive set of uh, novels of text, um, it's constructed a vocabulary and worked out a 300 length vector describing each word as it appears in those texts. And I guess that sounds pretty boring, but when you work out that, given that you've got a 300 things describing a particular word, you can actually run some interesting little equations on there and you can have a sort of a distance relationship between all the different words. And one of the big problems in natural language processing is the idea of context. So you can actually feed these sorts of equations in here and it will give the right answer. So the concept of king minus a man plus a woman, well that's queen. We can give it analogies, so London is to England as Paris is to France, and words close to Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, Perth. Um, 
uh, it's all available online. You can download it and play around with it when you want. Open worms. So right at the start, I said that humans have about 100 billion neurons within their, within their brains. Well, uh, a group have actually dissected, uh, dissected a flatworm and worked out, okay, so a flatworm has about 302 neurons. And so it's gone from there from, uh, to uh, putting the neurons that were, were, uh, that were sort of piped into controlling uh, activities on the nose of the, of the flatworm and it's got that as a sonar sensor on a robot and then it's used the motor neurons on the left and the right and it's put it onto wheels so uh, wheels or legs or whatever and so anyway it's used that architecture and plugged it into a like a little Lego driving car and everything and with minimal training it was learned it learned how to sort of drive around a particular room avoid obstacles know that when it hit a wall it needs to start moving along it and stuff like that uh, all that's freely on Available online as well. It's a bit creepy to watch, actually. Uh, when you think of... Sorry. Did you try and crawl inside anyone? No. <laughs> Although I probably turned it off before it could. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, star and planet detection. So, this is an interesting one. Um, our best telescope. Whenever there was a story in the news a few days ago about how they found a very Earth-like planet in a you know beyond a galaxy or something like that, and our telescopes can't actually see that directly. And there was a technique that was developed in the 1990s that worked out that when they're viewing stars in the sky, if they see something like a wobble like this, this more than likely indicates that there's a planet orbiting around it and that's causing that wobble. And so what they've done now is uh, trained a deep convolutional and recurrent network, so similar to with the image labelling, to actually detect features like that within images taken from the Hubble Space Telescope. And that's kind of the first port of call for um, sending alerts to NASA when it thinks that it's found a new possible planet to investigate. Uh, and this is the final one. So this is really cool. So what happened is that Microsoft developed a deep learning neural network to recognize uh, Richard Rashid, one of their top scientists' voice. And from that, it was able to display what words he was saying in English with 90% accuracy. And then they dem demoed this at a conference in Beijing and they decided to take it one step further. They used another neural network on top of that to actually translate whatever he was saying in English to Chinese in real time. And it did that with 70% accuracy. And uh, there's a YouTube clip of it, but uh, yeah, when they did that, he got you know, a standing ovation, which is a bit unknown and unheard of at uh, AI conferences. So with that... You want to look look where to go next? Sorry about the text heavy uh, text heavy slide, but uh, yeah, try all these places. Mm -hmm. I'll um, I'll post these all up to the meetup site later on, and uh, that's it. Any questions? <laughs> go for it. Um, you mentioned genetic algorithms in this as, as, as different to a neural network. Yep. I understood genetic algorithms kind of learned from their past to evolve towards a vertical. So how does that differ from a neural, neural network? I guess it randomizes the way it's learning a little bit more. Uh, yeah. yeah. That's, pro that's probably what would be my first thought. Yeah. Anybody else? Yep. Yeah. Go. Um, is there any applications of this to like um, market analysis and I'm, I would be surprised if it wasn't being used. Yeah. yeah. Um, I just think not, whoever is using it is probably not saying a lot about it. Yeah. But um, I'm not sure if anybody here has heard of Kaggle. So Kaggle is um, a site that runs sort of data analytics and data science competitions as a sport. So they'll uh, put up an input set and work out, okay, based on this input set, um, like a training set, it'll say, okay, we want to work out, get everybody to um, work out a predictive model for this, and then we'll have a, a, an anonymous tr uh, test set to test that on. And if you get something that's the best, the most predictive model based on that anonymous test set, uh, yeah, you get a cash prize. And what happened is um, up until about two or three, three or four years ago, 
there was a pretty even spread of the different sort of AI architectures and everything that were being used. You know, that was using gradient boost machines, support vector machines, um, decision trees. Um, but what you found is that once it hit to about, yeah, three and a half, four years ago, deep learning started to be the recurring thing that was, that was winning these competitions. Now, I'm not saying it's a silver bullet, but it's approaching a silver bullet. So, yeah. Yeah? Um, minimum processing power. Um, good question. They run on laptops. Or they they can run on a laptop, yeah. basically. Yeah. Um, the deep learning network that I tend to use often is one called Cafe, which is uh, you use that with Python or MATLAB if you're so inclined. Um, and that's running. That you're gonna need to hook into your um, your GPUs as well to run stuff, but. You can run it pretty easily on a laptop. I mean, I wouldn't run it on, say, I probably wouldn't run it on a MacBook Air, but a MacBook Pro, you probably could. Yeah, yeah I would imagine so. Don't quote me on that, but yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. Well, I've just on that marketing question. Um, so for a number of years now, um, people have been using things like uh, Microsoft ML, um, Analytics Server. Um, so with that, um, can, I've got lots of um, examples where you can get the complete set data set. Um, they have to go through and do predictive stuff on it so they can say, uh, hey, if someone buys a flight, then they're likely going to want to buy a fourth or something like that. And so they've got lots of examples where you can go and put that stuff up on your um, on the website. So um, mm -hmm. this is what Amazon does. Hey, you've just bought um, a book on whatever bike, so you want another book on the Zen um, bike. So they sort of have that for a nice policy. Um, if you want to use that type of stuff in, in larger scale, now um, Azure has um, Azure Machine Learning. Yeah. So which is very cool. Yeah. Someone else? Yeah. What Back. tools or libraries do you use to play with? So <laughs> these um, in .NET land, I would probably use a core.net. Um, JavaScript, if you really want to do that, um, I'll probably use ConfNet.js. But there's quite a few JavaScript libraries. Um, what kind of actually helped me is that I'm one of those people that learns best by kind of reinventing things a little bit. And so I actually tried to write my own little JavaScript neural network library. Um, I'm doing this talk at DDD in a couple of weeks. I'm hoping to have that ready so I can sort of do a demo that's sort of uh, actually just sort of pictorially showing how the network is learning. But uh, those would be the first three things I do. But um, if I was to learn more about neural networks, the first place I would go would be Neural Networks and Deep Learning. So that's a free book that's available online. Um, it's, uh, the code there is written in Python, but it's pretty easy to work out what's going on and port it to JavaScript, C Sharp, or whatever. So, yeah. Are there any cloud services? Are there cloud services? Cloud services. Um, so Azure Machine Learning is one. Um, AWS. Um, yeah, I'm sure if you just search for deep learning cloud services, yeah, you'll find quite a bit there. Yeah. Quick question: What is the legal situation of all these algorithms in terms of patents on the software? Because in terms, for example, in the realms of mobiles, yep. everything is heavily patented, so whatever you create on the mobile, you may be in legal trouble. What's the situation with all of all of, all of these frameworks? I mean, are there any great frameworks that are patented and you're not supposed to use them without a license, or are they available completely free? Um, Cafe is completely free. Um, ConfNet.js is completely free. I'm not sure about the situation with the core.net, but because uh, I haven't used it too much, but yeah, can't really tell you much more beyond that. Yeah. Anyone else? No? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I'll ch I'll chuck them up on the meetup site. So. Alright, um, the pizza's not quite here, but if you hear about five minutes, maybe we'll go there and then we'll take care of it. Thanks, Nick. Thanks.